So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody joining us online. My name is Richard van Hilversburg, and together with Simon Law, we are your chairs for today's virtual tumor board on esophageal neoplasm. Thank you for joining us for this first live presentation of the year. The International Society for Diseases of the Esophagus mission is to promote the exchange of scientific and medical knowledge of the esophagus among specialists in the field, and we are very happy to bring you this virtual presentation and discussion. Well, we are joined by a very outstanding uh, group of panelists from around the world. Uh, let me invite them to turn their webcam on. So uh, we have uh, Daniela Molina from uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Hospital in uh, USA. Uh, Professor Ken Kato from the National Cancer Center in Tokyo. Um, Trevor Long from uh, the Peter McCullum Cancer Center from Melbourne in Australia. Uh, Jacques Bergman from uh, the Amsterdam Medical Center in the Netherlands. And last but not least, uh, Christian Bruns from the University of uh, Cologne in, in Germany. So uh, we have a few uh, patients to discuss. Uh, I think let's not waste any time. We'll start with uh, the first uh, presentation. Okay. Right, we have the first uh, patient here. Well, it's a 68 year old man. Uh, he presented with a regurgitation of undigested food and dysphagia. Um, he's Chinese uh, in Hong Kong. He lost a lot of weight, 30 pounds, over a couple of months. He's a very thin individual. The BMI is only 16. Uh, only recently that he was diagnosed to have active uh, pulmonary tuberculosis and has just started on treatment. And uh, TP is uh, still not very uncommon uh, in this part of the world. So endoscopy show a tumor from 32 to 37 centimeter measure from the incisor and biopsy, not surprisingly, show a squamous cell cancer. And at the endoscopy, because of the dysphagia and the very narrowed lumen, uh, we took the chance to put in an esogastric tube to uh, uh, defeat him when we were working him up. So a, a CT scan and a PET scan showed a hypermetabolic tumor from T9 to T11, roughly about six centimeter in length, and the SUB max was 10. Um, you can see from the uh, chest x-ray, the sets of lungs are not really good. And on the CD scan, you see lots of opacities and there is this uh, white opacity in the left side of the lung as well. And it was interpreted uh, more like to be a tuberculosis. Uh, he had an endoscopic ultrasound, which showed a full thickness tumor with three small peritumoral lymph nodes, a respiratory assessment, a lung function test, uh, show that it really have a, quite a poor set of lungs with a very obstructive uh, pattern. So in summary, we have this uh, gentleman, a lower third SCC, a very poor lung function, active TB just being treated recently, a very suboptimal nutritional status and a very high risk uh, for surgery. So this is a CD scan showing the tumor is adjacent to the aorta. So we can have uh, some polling. Um, so what would be your management plan so uh, it's a vajectomy, definitive chemoradiation therapy, new adjuvant chemotherapy, chemo RT, radiotherapy, or palliative uh, stenting. Um, people can start to vote now. Uh, while we are waiting for the results, uh, maybe I can ask uh, Christine. So uh, given a patient like this in uh, Germany, what would be your choice? Well, thank you very much for this uh, nice presentation, Simon. I think um, in Germany, according to our S3 guidelines, um, for squamous cell carcinoma in the upper third of the thorax, we would decide, um, in particular with this comorbidity, uh, for definitive chemoradiotherapy. But before, we would probably also decide for a gastric feeding tube to insert, because they said the nutritional status is bad. And if we still think, and this is an individual decision that we probably can do um, surgery, um, we would interrupt the definitive chemoradiotherapy after 54, uh, 45 gray, and then do restaging quickly, and then decide to uh, fill up until chemo definitive chemoradiotherapy or for surgery. That would be 
the decision probably of our tumor board. Okay, um, well, coming back to Asia, um, Ken, this is a typical ESCC in Asia. In Japan, what would you do? Uh, you have to unmute yourself, Ken. Thank you, sorry. So, uh, thank you, Simon. Uh, in Asia, uh, not only Asia, but uh, especially in Japan, uh, for the resectable stage two, three, uh, as far as common cell carcinoma patient, uh, we uh, firstly uh, think about the neo adjuvant chemotherapy followed by surgery. And the, for the patient uh, who uh, uh, not candidate for the surgery, we uh, uh, considered about the definitive chemotherapy. In uh, this patient, uh, this is uh, uh, the, uh, the patient have a, a low function of the uh, pulmonary function. Uh, but uh, we uh, this uh, this patient is relatively young, uh, the middle of the esophageal cancer. So maybe the uh, we we firstly started the uh, uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and that the response uh, will be uh, re uh, evaluated, and we consider uh, for the surgery or chemotherapy. Uh, it's discussed in the uh, tumor board maybe. Okay, what about um, Trevor in Australia? What would you do? Well, I think the, 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 the picture you're painting, Simon, is, is of someone who's probably not fit for surgery. And if, if that was confirmed to be the case, then we would treat him with definitive chemo radiation to 50.4 gray with concurrent chemotherapy. If the patient was fit for surgery, um, then we would normally treat with neoadjuvant chemo radiation using a cross-type protocol. Occasionally our surgeons will tell us the patient is borderline fit for surgery, um, which, which does make it a little bit more confusing. And if that's the case, we will treat to a higher radiation dose. We'll probably go to 50.4 gray as we would in the definitive setting. Right. And then we'll assess, because if, if, the patient, if the patient subsequently does not go for surgery afterwards, then you've missed that chance to give him potentially curative treatment. Right. Well, we, we do have a, um, a question from Edward Chong from the UK. He said, what about the TB treatment? Does the TB worrying you guys, giving chemotherapy and radiotherapy? It's, uh, well, it's not something we see in Australia um, at all. I mean, I, I would, as for any sort of infection, I would, I would consult the ID physicians for their advice, but it's probably an issue more with chemotherapy than radiotherapy, so I'll probably ask Ken what he thinks there. Yeah, Ken, uh, tuberculosis, are you worried? Ken? Hi, yeah. Yeah, tuberculosis is one of the, uh, the uh, this indication for the uh, surgery. So we uh, uh, simply uh, consult to the, uh, the surgeons and the anastomosis. Right, okay. Um, sorry, I forgot about some uh, housekeeping rules. So uh, participants, uh, if you're uh, participating in the webinar, if you have questions, uh, use the Q&A function, not the chat function, if you can. Uh, we try to answer, but obviously we won't be able to answer every question. So uh, after the webinar, there will be uh, some uh, chance to answer your questions on our website. Um, so Leia, can we see the voting results? So, okay, definitive chemoradiation therapy is winning, followed by new adjuvant therapy. All right, I guess uh, people don't wonder it's a vajectomy because of the picture that I painted. Uh, indeed, uh, we discussed in our own tumor board, uh, we really felt that he wasn't a candidate for a subjectomy, uh, you know, given the poor nutritional stages, the poor lung function, uh, and the active TB. So we decided to treat him with chemoradiation therapy using the RTOG protocol. Uh, but even then, he wasn't tolerating the therapy very well, poor tolerance to chemotherapy, so we had to stop after the first cycle. Um, he did eventually complete a radiotherapy to 50 gray. So that was the post-treatment uh, outcome. The stricture was from 33 to 36 centimeter. Uh, it did look much better on the CD scan, but as you can see on the endoscopy, it's still quite swollen and we couldn't really go past it. Um, and the lung, uh, after the, you know, some weeks of TB treatment is actually improved, 
Uh, PET scan again show no uh, real metastases, uh, mild uptick in the primary tumor. So now we are having this uh, very resistant uh, stricture. Uh, over the five, five months, uh, we kept on dilating it, uh, even injecting steroids, it was very resistant. Uh, we repeated biopsies, the uh, cancer, and it was all came back to be negative. Uh, maybe I can ask Jack, uh, what should we do now? Re very resistant stricture, post-radiation, we just could not show that there is residual disease left behind. Um, well, this is a tough case. I'm trying to start up my video, but the host has apparently stopped it. So basically, you only want to hear my voice and not see my face. Not sure if I should take that as a compliment. <laughs> okay, here we go. Here I am. Yeah, we, yeah. We thank you thank you for having me join in this virtual tumor board um yeah this is a tough decision because you're not sure if you're dealing with a very effective treatment and a complication of just a radiotherapy uh, or that somewhere underneath there may still be hidden cancer uh, yeah. so for the time being basically there's not much you can do than to dilate the patient endoscopically and to continue uh, tissue sampling uh, sometimes um, with CT scanning to see if there's any signs of distant metastases because that logically would also have significant therapeutic implications. Uh, right. And as time passes by and this becomes more and more a post-radiotherapy benign stenosis, then you have to think about how you can best manage this because then constant dilatations uh, is still associated with significant risk and a poor quality of life. So we then some point we'll teach the patient to do self dilatations and that's been remarkably well in our hands in Amsterdam. Okay, um, well, let, let's have some voting again. So either we will keep on dilating, uh, we can put in stents, endoscopic incisional therapy and even surgery. Uh, again, while we are waiting for the uh, voting results, um, well, the surgeons, uh, Christian, Daniela and Richard, would any one of you go and take the patient to the operating room? Well, shall I start? I would say no, not at the moment. Um, we would uh, keep this indeed by, first of all, further probably dilation, but we would switch in the situation of thinking that we, um, in this in entire uh, condition of the patient, never give, get him to surgery, we'll probably switch for stenting then after a while, but first dilation done standing, but not surgery at the moment. That would be our decision probably. Right, Daniela? Yeah, I think that first of all, I wanna make a comment about the treatment. You know, we don't really do um, neoadjuvant versus definitive. We just give everybody chemo radiation to 50-40 and that's just our protocol. With that, we have about 50% PCR. So if the patient had a really good response, uh, we uh, put them in very strict surveillance protocol. However, when you have a refractory strictures like this, I would be worried that the patient is harboring disease and the, the tumor is distal enough that it's really not involving much of the airways and his PFTs, lung function is not terrible. So if he's improved his nutritional status, and of course is, a lot depends on his functional overall status, I would potentially offer him surgery at this point. Okay, even without a proven disease? Yeah, because you know his quality of life is going to be miserable uh, with that stricture, and uh, uh, you can definitely teach him to self-dilate. But in my experience, these patients uh, have a really very poor uh, quality of life, and uh, uh, they won't be able to eat. And that's the whole purpose, you know. That maybe because I'm Italian, you know, like it's very important. <laughs> Eating is important for quality of life, and I'm not doing in, worry about involvement of the airways in this patient because it seems like the majority of the tumor is distal. Yeah, uh, sure. And and uh, Jacques, you know, what about physical endoscopic incisional therapy uh, or uh, stents? You like that sort of uh, treatment? Yeah, incision therapy only for very short stenosis. This clearly is a way too long of a stenosis to uh, right. to safely do incisional therapy. Please don't do that. We'll get you in trouble. Okay. Um, and and stenting for these stenosis only for is only a short term solution. And in the end, these stents actually get you more and more into trouble. Um, so. 
uh, I would I would disagree in sending this patient for surgery with even accepting the chance that you would do the surgery for benign disease. I think you can give these patients excellent quality of life with endoscopic management and with self dilatations. We have 70 patients in, in our self dilatation program and they all eat steak and they don't undergo a single dilatation. It's just a matter of prolonged and good coaching. It's not easy, but it, its effect is really underestimated. And the effect of endoscopic treatment, stenting, incisional therapy, steroid injections for complex stenosis like this is really overestimated. At best, a short-term effect. In the end, it only gets you into trouble. Okay. Well, uh, Lorenzo, <clears throat> Lorenzo Veri have a comment. He says, uh, does a persistent stricture without proven histologic recurrence mean clinical complete response in the center? Uh, I suppose it's very difficult to say. Uh, my own experience is that that sort of look and feel of that stricture is very suspicious of a residual disease. Uh, well, but then we couldn't prove it. Uh, Leah, can we see the polling results? So keep on dilating, followed by stenting. Okay, all right, interesting. So uh, what we did was um, we kept dilating, just like uh, you said. So over six months, we kept on dilating. And in fact, we put in stents because uh, again, stent is not a permanent solution. We felt that it was really benign. We put in a stent and we will leave it for too long. We won't be able to take it out. So every time we left it for about a month. Uh, and so we took it out again. And you can see the endoscopic picture here after dilatation, it's really split at the, uh, the esophageal mucosa. You can see the stent there. Uh, but every time we took the stent out, it very quickly um, uh, stenosed again. So the, you can see on the chest X-ray, its general condition is improved somewhat, but the lungs are still not very good. Um, and again, we had a tumor board. We decided really he couldn't really stand his vajectomy. So um, what we did, was a bypass. So uh, we did a uh, sort of modified Kirchner bypass. Uh, that's diagrammatically, that's the cancer. We closed the top end, we brought the stomach retrosternally and hooked it to the cervical esophagus and the patient could eat again. Now it's a slight variation on the usual lower end uh, esophageal jejunostomy. Uh, we actually take a longer loop, loop and uh, put the end just underneath the skin. Uh, we just uh, want to do that because in the event that there is something happening here or that there's a proximal dilatation, potentially we can open up the stoma and do endoscopy through this loop uh, into the esophagus. Uh, so this trick is maybe from our experience with the recurrent biogenic cholangitis, which we used to see quite a lot in Asia uh, when we did a lot of hepatico cutaneous jejunostomy to deal with intrahepatic stones. So uh, we left a loop here and then uh, just in case that we provide access. Actually, he did very well. He recovered from the bypass uh, discharge uh, post-op day eight. Um, uh, we actually just uh, noticed that now it's 14 months after the bypass. Uh, he is enjoying a good quality of life. He recently actually did a PET scan. Uh, there is still no evidence of recurrent disease. The esophagus stay exactly the same. So hopefully um, there is really no tumor there and uh, we have sorted out his problem. Um, just to give you an example of what happened to a esophagus after a bypass, this patient, uh, you, you might see the date, it was 1999. We don't do this operation much anymore, but this was the case when we had a dilated mucosil after a bypass operation. Um, fortunately in this patient, it didn't happen, uh, but uh, this is one thing that we always kept in the back of our, my, our mind. That's why we did this sort of uh, cutaneous loop underneath the skin, just in case that we need to have access uh, in the future. So uh, this is uh, case number one. Uh, any more questions from the panel before we moved on to the second patient? Well, we actually will have some time at the end. So if you have some questions, we can reserve it till the end for our free flowing discussion. Um, I'll pass the, uh, uh, the mic to Richard, uh, who is going to chair the, uh, the second uh, case. 